Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the Community Manager. Today, Diana Noble is going to help you grow your business at warp speed by taking control of your time. Let's get to know Diana at a personal level. Diana, I've got three questions. First question, what is the best decision that you have ever made? I think that would have to be moving to Fort McMurray, Alberta. That was a catalyst of change in my life in epic proportions. I was really young into my early 20s, and I would not be an entrepreneur today had I not made that move. Hello to all my former Ontario <laughs> folks that are in the room. That's where I moved from, and uh, we've, I've been here now for 14 years. And, and it, this is not one of the three questions. This is 1A, 1B. <laughs> What's so special about Fort McMurray? Ah, uh, Fort McMurray. It is the land of opportunity. It is the place where you can come and make all of your wildest dreams come true. Uh, there are so many opportunities for entrepreneurs here. The community supports the entrepreneurial spirit. And it is just a magical land. <laughs> it's not magical, but uh, it. I don't think the opportunity that is available here, you will find too many other places. Well, I, so milk and honey is flowing down High Street, Fort McMurray. More like oil, but uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Question number two. What is your superpower? My superpower would be my attention to detail. I get complimented on my attention to detail all the time and it drives everybody who works with me batty because I can pick a mistake out of a, you know, needle out of a haystack. Uh, I have really high attention to detail and it's just, it's just part of who I am. I'm a former journalist as well. And uh, writing is, is a big thing for me. And with all of my staff and, and whatnot, uh, just, I, I just see things. It's just, you know, it's not even just about writing. I could just be on the road somewhere and I'll just notice something far in the distance that other people would be oblivious to. It's, that would be my superpower. Question number three. And uh, what is the biggest challenge that you've ever had to overcome? This is an incredibly personal tale. I might get a little teary eyed here because it's very sentimental to me. Um, but the biggest challenge I ever overcame was infertility. I struggled to have my son. It took three years of trying and then inevitably we went through in vitro fertilization to bring him into the world. And I know that sounds really strange, um, you know, in terms of a challenge that I've overcome, but that was, you know, when it comes to all of my businesses, I feel like I'm completely 100% in control and I'm able to manifest whatever it is that I want. But this was something that took a lot more and, and I was really I could not necessarily control the situation and I resisted against it for many, many years. Thankfully, it all worked out. I love my son. He's almost five years old. Today was his last day of ECDP for the, for the school year. And uh, yeah, that, that would be it. Lots right. of hurdles there. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing that very personal story with us. Now, uh, attendees, otherwise known as participants in in meetup terms, uh, 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 please stay on, uh, if you possibly can, stay, come on and stay on camera. That's because Diana is going to get her energy from you and there's not an awful lot of energy available to her if you're not on camera. Now there are mitigating circumstances. If you simply can't, that's fine too. But if you can, please come on camera. Uh, stay muted and type any questions you've got into the chat. Uh, at about every 10 minute interval, I'll take your questions, batch them and pose them to Diana. Rest assured, all your questions will get answered by the end of her workshop. The workshop is being recorded and uh, you'll be sent a link to the recording tomorrow. Uh, Diana, are you ready to knock our socks off? I'm ready as ever. All right, I'm going to unspotlight me. 
I'm going to go to full screen. And you take it away. She's all yours. All right. Well, thank you so much. I am so grateful to be here with such a great room of entrepreneurs. I was listening to everything that you do, your skill sets, and I am just thrilled to be here in your company. I'm thrilled that you felt the need to come here this tonight and learn something from me. And I hope by the end of today's session that you will have some takeaways. So let's get started to take control of your time and grow a kick-ass business. So my name is Diana Noble, and I like to identify myself as a serial entrepreneur because it's just easier than saying everything that I do. So when somebody asks me, hey, what do you do for a living? That is my response. In the last decade, I've owned and operated five separate businesses, four of which I still have today, and one of which I sold three years ago. Uh, we uh, During the conversation, we were talking about focus and, and whatnot. Well, you can have multiple passions and make them all a success. I am a living testament of that. So anybody who is a multi-passionate entrepreneur, keep going. You'll have to put some focus into it. We'll talk about that here this evening. So as you can imagine, it takes a lot of discipline to juggle a variety of businesses. And the most important aspect is learning how to use your time effectively. Over the years, I'd like to think that I've done a pretty good job of using my energy in ways that bring me the most satisfaction in my life and that allow me to balance everything that I have on the go, not only when it comes to my businesses, but also in my personal life of being a mom, a wife, and a volunteer. So these are my four businesses that I run every single day. I've got a coaching company, a process serving company, a media and marketing company, and a real estate brokerage. Uh, I run these businesses every single day, but I'm also a mom, I'm also a wife, I'm a roller derby player, and so much more. Just being a business owner is not what defines my life, but rather all of the different aspects of my life packaged into one. So the questions that I get asked the most, as I'm sure you can imagine, based on that introduction are, how do you do it all? And do you ever sleep? Well, we're gonna talk about the first one today. And the second question, yes, I absolutely sleep. And Roger, when you were talking about one of the upcoming uh, speeches that are coming up, I think in August or maybe in July, Jason, I think it was, you absolutely need to prioritize your sleep as an entrepreneur. Let me tell you, it takes a ton of energy to do what we do every day. You cannot cut out your sleep or else, let me tell you, the mistakes, the lack of energy, it, it just won't serve you. So I do get my pretty much eight hours of sleep every single night. So today we are going to be talking about three things in particular. Number one, reconnecting to your why. And I was so excited when I heard, I think it was Miguel talking about Start With Why by Simon Sinek. So important to connect to your why and remembering the reason that you became an entrepreneur to begin with. And of course, using that to fuel your motivation for success. Number two, we're going to talk about shifting from busy to productive by focusing on high return on investment activities that will actually move your business forward instead of spinning your wheels on a day to day basis. And number three, taking control of your time by implementing strategies that will increase your efficiency while eliminating distractions to ensure that you are, in fact, growing a kick ass business and not just creating a nine to five job for yourself. But before we get on to all of that, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background with about me. So I've always been a bit of a rebel. My mom is actually here joining us this evening, and uh, she can surely attest to that. Uh, if you ask my parents what I was like growing up, they might use words or phrases like defiant or independent or even a pain in the ass. For longer than I can remember, I have marched to the, meet, the beat of my own drum. Um, 
early on, a lot of people dismissed me thinking that, you know, if I couldn't conform to society standards or expectations, then I was a write-off. But I credit my rebel mentality for being where I am today, because I definitely bring that into being an entrepreneur. And without it, I likely would have never had the guts or tenacity to pursue a life of serial entrepreneurship. 20 days before my 16th birthday, on the heels of entering grade 11, I moved into my very first apartment. I looked around my small one bedroom, one bathroom apartment that had barely any furniture in it, but that didn't matter to me because I was finally free. Sorry, mom. Uh, <laughs> I broke away from the chains of my parents' expectations of me. And in that moment, I knew that nobody could tell me what to do. I was responsible for my own life and my own decisions. And if I wanted to stay up all night partying and skip school, then that was on me. Of course, that didn't work out in my favor, but hey, it was on me and I suffered the consequences for any of my actions back then. You see, my dad was in the military and he ran a very autocratic lifestyle at home that really didn't mesh with my rebel mentality. I love my dad dearly, but I did not do well operating under his authority. And him and I, we butted heads all the time growing up. My family had high expectations, and I'm not just speaking about my parents, but even extending to my grandparents and my aunts and uncles. And I felt that I would never live up to those expectations. I felt very much like an outcast, a black sheep, if you will, who never had the approval from my family unless I was conforming to what they wanted. So I rebelled instead. I thought to myself, well, if I'm never gonna live up to their expectations anyway, then I might as well just do my own thing. My rebel mentality has been with me my entire life, even now as a successful business owner. If someone tells me I can't do something, the rebel is unleashed and I work that much harder to prove them wrong. That's not why I became an entrepreneur. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but it's definitely why I've stayed one and why I refuse to ever be an employee ever again. So this is me. There's a side by side from when I'm roughly 18 years old to a couple of years ago that other photo was taken. Looking at this side by side to, you know, 18 to about 32, you can see that some things never change. The difference, though, is that at 18, I was very much a rebel without a cause. Today, as an entrepreneur, my cause is so big that I now use my rebel mentality to show entrepreneurs that they too can have the life that they want, that they don't have to choose between happiness and success, and that they can have it all. They just have to go out and get it. Hopefully that, those photos don't offend anybody, but <laughs> that's me. That's what you get. What you see is what you get. So speaking about why, my why, I became an entrepreneur by accident. I was working at a law firm making extra money delivering legal documents on the side. And when they decide to close that business, I immediately panicked. I mean, how would I make ends meet without this extra money coming in every month? I approached my boss and we brainstormed ways that I could make their business work. And she ended up planting the seed that I, 24-year-old Diana Noble, a college dropout, could start my own business. Well, that seed grew like, giant, uh, like a giant beanstalk, Jack and the giant beanstalk, and I was now Jack. When people question my ability and my lack of experience, it only fueled my fire. Within days, I had my own corporation and the rebel within me never looked back. It was the best decision ever. Even though I said my best decision ever was moving to Fort McMurray, that was another best decision ever. So these days, being an entrepreneur is a conscious decision. I now call myself a serial entrepreneur having opened those four other businesses and I finally conquered that beanstalk. People become or stay entrepreneurs for various reasons. I'll tell you why I chose to be an entrepreneur, but first I'd love to know why everyone else in this room chose to become an entrepreneur. So if you can just pop into the chat really quickly, your why, why you initially became an entrepreneur. I'd love to see where everyone's at. 
freedom. Okay, wonderful. Entrepreneur is more exciting, definitely. Too rowdy to be an employee. I love that. Job is boring, like working for a variety of companies. To be strong and free. Absolutely. So my why and the why of most entrepreneurs, as many of you just noted, is freedom. Freedom of my time, of my ability to make money, and freedom of my creativity to be a leader of my own life. So when I think of a, the life that being an entrepreneur affords me, it propels me forward when times get tough. There's an anonymous quote that says, entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people won't, so you, that you can spend the rest of your life like most people can't. So focusing on your why, the real reason behind owning your business, such as freedom, for example, will keep you moving forward when things aren't fine and dandy, and it'll be a me measurement by which you base your actions and will help you stay focused on what really matters. Sadly, along the way, many of us entrepreneurs, we forget about our why and we fall victim to the trials and tribulations that come with being an entrepreneur. When we aren't connected to our why, we end up like this. Does this look like anybody's life right now where you're juggling a whole bunch of different things and all of these different responsibilities are up in the air? A lot of entrepreneurs feel this way, trying to juggle so many different things at once. Not right. only do you, sorry, and go ahead. This is probably a good time for a first question. Sure, go ahead. Because it's on topic. Yeah. This is from Jane. I also have multiple businesses. Most of the time, I don't know how I should introduce myself as when somebody asks me what I do. Should I tell them business A or business B, which are dramatically different? Uh, what is your recommendation? I'd say do whatever feels good to you because there is no right answer. I like to introduce myself as a serial entrepreneur, but of course that sparks questions. Okay, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, sometimes depending on the environment that I'm in, for example, if I'm attending a networking event for realtors, I might just introduce myself as a real estate broker of my company. If I'm attending an event for uh, business owners that could potentially be clients of mine, I might introduce myself as a business coach. There's no one size fits all. I, I would say figure out you know, who your audience is in that moment and do what feels right to you. Thank you. I have no further questions. Back to you, Diana. All right, no worries. So. Uh, going back to this photo, not only do you have to deal with the millions of moving parts when it comes to running a business, you also have your home life, your family, your volunteer obligations to balance. I refer to this as the balancing act because it really is just an act. There is no such thing as true balance because something will always take priority over something else. At the end of the day, true success lies in feeling like you have it all under control, being satisfied in all of the roles that you play, and managing to juggle all of those moving parts in your life without letting the balls drop. So early in, in, in the early days of me being an entrepreneur, I felt like the lady in this photo. I was driving down Main Street, frantically going from one meeting to another. I hadn't eaten. I was cranky and stressed out because my day was so chaotic. I hate being late, but I hadn't given myself enough time to get from one place to another, and I was panicking. That was a turning point for me. The sad thing was that this was a common occurrence in my life back then. I was running three businesses and trying to cram as much as I could into every single day, trying to get as much as I could done. I was neglecting myself. I wasn't eating healthy. Sometimes I wouldn't even eat at all. And I definitely wasn't getting enough sleep. I wasn't prioritizing myself. And the screwed up part is that 
I was doing it to myself. There's this song by Radiohead that always comes to mind when I think about this. And if you're a Radiohead fan, maybe you'll recognize this song. It goes, you do it to yourself, you do. And that's why it really hurts. You do it to yourself, just you. Anyways, I won't carry on with my terrible singing. Um, <laughs> but uh, if this scene sounds familiar to you, type yes in the chat. If you feel like every day is just a little bit of chaos and you're just really not prioritizing yourself and your health and your well-being. So without tapping into our why, we get in our own way by focusing on the wrong things. And those wrong things keep us tied to our businesses, stressed out and burnt out. When you finally hit burnout, which you inevitably will if you carry on like that for too long, you are no good to your business or anyone else around you. This is why it is so important to have a system to make damn sure that you're taking care of yourself, that you're able to manage what matters and that you are working effectively towards your why. And then of course, you know, you have those moments when urgent situations arise when you are least expecting them. You can be sure that things will happen as an entrepreneur that you couldn't have forecasted even with a psychic on your payroll, some of which will turn your whole entire world upside down. And I had heard in the conversations we were having about if you are a solopreneur, this has the ability to put you under. So this is really important to tune in if you are a solo entrepreneur. Oh. Some people call what I'm about to talk about Murphy's Law. Some people call it bad luck. I like to call it, my slide won't go. <laughs> I like to call it shit happens. I had all intentions tonight of telling you about a story when my son almost died a week after being born while I was running three businesses with no help. But given the events that have transpired this past month, I thought another story might be more relevant or at least more recent to fully articulate this notion. I had planned to spend the month of June polishing today's presentation. I had sessions scheduled with my coach. I had a plan I had been working on for several months, but in typical fashion, shit happens. With little more than a week's notice, at the beginning of this month, I got a phone call that I was waiting a year to receive. It was my doctor's office. They indicated they had an opening to conduct my hysterectomy the following week. I was full of emotion, fear, anxiety, a little bit of relief combined with a little bit of panic. Only three weeks before that call, I had been told I would get a few months notice and based on where my name was on the list, I could anticipate that my surgery would take place around the end of August. Imagine my surprise getting a little more than a week's notice. So as I sit before you here today, I am 16 days post-op. That's me 16 days ago in that picture. Needless to say, the plan I had went right out the window. But thankfully, I have learned over the past 11 years of being an entrepreneur that things like this happen all the time when you least expect it. Well, maybe not exactly this, but, you know, other things happen similar to this that will knock you off your feet. So this demonstrates the importance of managing your time well when everything is coming up roses and rainbows. Inevitably, shit will happen and you'll have to deal with it whether you like it or not or whether you've planned for it or not. However, if you set yourself up for success when the times are relatively predictable and smooth sailing, it makes those difficult curveballs a little easier to catch. There is never a good time for an emergency. Okay, remember that. Never a good time for an emergency, but they will happen throughout the course of being an entrepreneur. So a lot of entrepreneurs that I work with walk around as if everyone else is in control of their time. Okay, they allow themselves to be pulled in a variety of different directions, whether that's by their family or by their staff, by their clients, whoever. They fail to set expectations with their clients. They put themselves on the back burner. They get distracted by every demand and notification, and they run themselves ragged trying to be everything to everyone. Truth bomb time! We are the only 
only ones that can truly control our time. I'm just going to repeat that for a moment. We are the only ones who can control our time. We can choose to keep running around like a chicken with our head cut off, knowing full well that this is destructive behavior, or we can make a conscious choice to do something different. And what does different look like, you might ask? Let me introduce you to high return on investment activities. What is a high return on investment activity? Well, it is a concept that I learned early into my journey as an entrepreneur from a leader who is now a partner of mine named Ian Hill. This concept gave me a lot to think about in terms of how I manage my time. And I've been sharing this with entrepreneurs for the past nine years or so. A high return on investment activity is something that gives you the greatest return for the time and energy invested in a chosen area of your life. It's focusing on the things that will move your business and other areas of your life forward in a positive way instead of letting the hours roll by without anything to show for them. It is so easy to get caught in the hustle trap. In our current culture, it's almost like a badge of honor to be the busiest person around. You ask someone, how is your day? Busy. How are you doing? I'm busy. How often do you hear that as an entrepreneur when you're speaking to other people? I know there are certain people that that's the only response that I get from them. But here's the thing. Busy does not equal productive. And with so only so many hours in any given day, you owe it to yourself to use your time wisely. So there are four steps to the high return on investment process, roles, goals, high ROI activities, and time blocking. But before I break those down, it's important to figure out the cap on your time. Sorry, I had to take a little hydro break there. <clears throat> so I want you to do a little, do me a little favor here. I want you to close your eyes and visualize for a moment and imagine that you are at the 24-7 bank at 12 a.m. Your banker, who's really trying to gain your future loyalty, agrees to deposit $86,400 into your bank account on one condition. You must spend every single penny by 11.59 p.m. that day or it disappears forever. What do you do with your money? Pop it in the chat. If time equals money, then money must equal time. Time is a valuable commodity. Like money, which we spend and we save and we waste and we even try to borrow or lend. But unlike money, time is not replenishable. There's always more money. There is never more time. No matter what your job title is or how important you are or how much money you have, you only have 168 hours a week to work with, which is 86,400 seconds every single day, in case you didn't catch that uh, reference with the example before. Um, that is it, that is all. It doesn't matter how much more time you want, that's all you've got, 168 hours in a week. So from that 168 hours, subtract how many hours a night you sleep. Then subtract how long it takes to make and eat food each day. Subtract the time that it takes to get showered and ready. And then subtract any travel time throughout the day to get to where you need to go. Everyone's final number will vary slightly, but most people have on average 100 remaining hours left over. 100 hours to get everything you need to get done in any given week. Now you might be thinking 100 hours, I can do so much in that period of time. And you'd be right if you are disciplined enough to use that time wisely. But remember, it's not realistic to spend all of that time on your business. Most of you have a family or hobbies or friends, and those are important aspects of what makes life worth living that you simply cannot overlook if you're going to have a happy and successful life. 
If you're in the startup phase of your business, chances are that the number of hours you spend on building your business per week will be much greater than somebody who has been running their business for the past 10 years or so. And while there's certainly a time and a place for the hustle, which is really required to get your business going, it is not a long-term sustainable solution. At some point, you're going to break. <clears throat> I don't know why my mouse doesn't like to work this evening. Anyways, so going back to the high return on investment uh, strategy, the first step is to identify what roles you play in your life. Are you a spouse, a parent, a business owner, a volunteer? Figure out each role you play and write it down. When I do this activity with some of my coaching clients, so often they forget to identify themselves as a role. So remember, you as a person is one of the most important roles you play. No labels necessary. So don't forget to, when you're doing this, to write yourself as, as a role. Uh, some of my roles are, you know, wife, mother, daughter, business owner, times four, board director, roller derby player, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and Diana Noble, of course, in my own right. So identify the roles that you play in your life. Second step is to figure out what your overarching goals are for each role. In my marriage, for example, one of my goals is to have a happy and healthy marriage. Sounds pretty achievable, right? It's a lot harder than you think sometimes. But anyways, I digress. In my coaching business, one of my goals is to achieve my professional certified coach designation through the International Coach Federation in 2023. You can have multiple goals for each role. Just make sure that the goals that you have are related, that are related to your business are quantifiable. So think SMART goals. Anybody here familiar with the SMART acronym? Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So the goals that you have for your more personal roles may not fit into that structure, but the more specific you can get, of course, the more that you're setting yourself up for success. Step number three is to identify the high return on investment activities for each of your roles that will bring you closer to your goals. So remember, a high return on investment activity is one that gives you the greatest return of investment for your time and energy spent. So for my goal of getting my PCC credential for coaching, my high return on investment activities are when I'm actually coaching clients, either one-on-one -on -one or in group sessions. I need a certain number of coaching hours to reach that goal. So the highest ROI activity is actually coaching. Another goal that I have as a business coach is to empower entrepreneurs to overcome challenges so that they can thrive and succeed. So if that's the case, does spending my time cleaning my office bring me closer to that goal? Hell no, <laughs> it does not. Uh, but doing things like I'm doing right here with you guys all right now checks off that box for me. So using the example, the personal example of having a loving marriage, I know that one of the high return on investment activities, one of the biggest high ROI activities I can do with my husband is to carve out time for him, that's just devoted to him where I'm not typing on my laptop or distracted by work. This is a picture of my, two pictures of me and my family. My husband, you see, he's a diehard hockey fan. So for me, if I never watched another hockey game for the rest of my life, I would be totally okay with that. But my husband, no way, no how. Specifically, he is a Toronto Maple Leafs fan for all of the Ontario folks that are, well, I guess the Toronto folks that are in the house. Um, but I don't blame any of you if you feel like logging off of this presentation right now that I've just mentioned that. Um, that's okay. <laughs> Another thing you should know about my husband is that he hates his photo being taken and he rarely smiles. As you can see from these two photos, though, there's no objections and he looks incredibly happy. That's because he loves hockey. So going back to my goal of being a wife and having a happy marriage, I know that going to a hockey game is a huge high ROI activity for that role that brings me closer to that goal. So now you might be confused why we're actually wearing Edmonton Oilers jerseys in the photo on the right, being that, you know, my husband's a diehard Leafs fan. Well, sadly, the Leafs, if you've been following, they didn't make the first round. They didn't make it past the first round of playoffs this year. Um, but that photo there is our very first 
NHL playoffs game that happened last month with the Battle of Alberta between Calgary and Edmonton, and I scored major brownie points for taking him to that event. As you can see, my son had a pretty good time too. So just to kind of bring this point full circle, if I have spent the exact same amount of time with my husband watching an episode of Married at First Sight on TV in our living room, the payoff in his mind would have been way less. Same amount of time, different result. okay? So high return on investment activities. So now that you have your list of all of your high ROI activities, step number four is to time block them in your calendar to make sure that you are prioritizing those activities. This may seem like a fairly simple task, but for some reason, it is the most important things as entrepreneurs that we sometimes neglect. So good strategy is every Sunday, designate 30 minutes of your day planning your week ahead. So first thing that you're going to do is you're going to block off time for the high ROI activities for your roles. Then you're going to schedule your important meetings, followed by whatever other tasks you need to accomplish. As an entrepreneur, your calendar is your best friend. I repeat, your calendar is your best friend. I use a two calendar system myself. My Google calendar is my number one go to where everything gets booked. And then I also have my iPad that has a PDF calendar app that I can write on with my Apple pencil. I still like writing things down. And, you know, they say when you write things down, it it creates more. I don't know what the word is. Uh, Stick to itiveness in your brain um, for those things that you write down. But whatever tool that you use, just make sure that you have some sort of calendar that works for you. If it's not your calendar, simply put, it is not getting done, period. Without scheduling your high ROIs and your to-dos, you will run your business like a hamster on a hamster wheel who's working really hard to get somewhere, but ends up going nowhere. All right, so you might be thinking, wait a second, what do I do about all of those other things that have to get done for my business, but that aren't on my high ROI list? Well, it's time to fill you in on a not so secret D word. Delegate, delegate. So this in itself is a strategy used to move your business forward. It seems so simple and yet so many business owners try to take on the world themselves without soliciting any help. Delegation can be a really scary idea, especially if you suffer from a disease called perfectionism. Any other fellow perfectionists in the room? Yeah, okay. I know all about being a perfectionist Um, and I I get it. Um, Being afraid to let go and let someone else in for the fear that they won't do it as well as you can, or you know, just being nitpicky and thinking that you can do it better, or why should I get someone else to do it? They're gonna take longer to do it when I can just quickly get that done. This is a mistake. I say this as a self-professed perfectionist, so trust me, I do get the struggle, but there comes a point where, you, where your need to strive for perfection will hold you back and burn you out. One of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was from one of my former realtors. He said, Diana, learn to be okay with 80%. That has always stuck with me. And it is something that I try to live by because realistically, there's no such thing as perfect anyways, right? I still have my challenges when it comes to perfectionism and, uh, You know, it is what it is, but I definitely don't let it hold me back from taking action or from letting someone else take care of something that really doesn't serve those last hundred or so hours I have left to my disposal every single week. So what kind of things can you delegate? Well, you can delegate marketing, you can delegate bookkeeping, phone calls and emails, cleaning, food delivery or grocery shopping services and all of those weaknesses that aren't worth your time and energy. So right about now, you may be thinking to yourself, hold on, Diana, I have nobody to delegate to, 
and or no money to hire someone to delegate to. And if I do have people and I do have money, I am so busy being busy that I don't have time to train someone so I can delegate to them. <laughs> Does this resonate with anybody in the room? <laughs> a lot of people deal with this, but I'm going to challenge you to think about something for a moment. So let me ask, what is your most successful hour in your business? If you had the best hour ever from a financial standpoint as a direct result of your actions, what would that look like and what is the earning potential? Put that in the chat if you could. What is your, what is your maximum earning potential in a given hour? So maybe you're running a service-based business and you charge per hour. Maybe you have a product-based business and it's equivalent to how much you could sell in that period of time. Nine a.m. to ten a.m. is worth a thousand dollars to me. Absolutely, the, a lot of your businesses you can make so much money in just one hour. So let's talk about for a moment those tasks that you could delegate or pay someone else to do. I'm going to use the example of having someone clean your home. So my house takes minimum. I'm being gracious here. I have a four-year-old and a dog, minimum four hours to clean at $25 an hour. So that equates to roughly a hundred dollar expense. But if that hundred dollars enabled me to make a thousand dollars, would that be money and time well spent? Heck yeah. So often we focus on the short-term consequence instead of the long-term results. And it all comes down to a mindset shift. Is it an expense or is it an investment? Is it I can't or I won't or refuse to? Do you have no time? A lot of people, you know, you ask them to do something like, I don't have time, I'm like, no time. Do they have no time or are they just spending too much time on the wrong things? In 2014, I became the owner of a local monthly newspaper publication. We had a distribution route of 8,000 papers spanning a radius of roughly 300 kilometers that had to be hand delivered every single month. Not to throw my husband under the bus, who is very much the opposite of an entrepreneur, but he could not fathom why I would spend $1,200 a month on paying someone else to deliver those papers instead of pocketing that money and spending 12 plus hours doing that job myself. Well, back then, if I had sold one full page ad in that in that 12 hour span, I would have profited five hundred dollars over what I was paying out for delivery and still have all of my energy intact. I will tell you, if you're ever asked to hand deliver eight thousand papers in a three hundred kilometer radius, don't do it. It's hard work. You'll need a few days to recover. I learned that the hard way a couple of times. And then I said, I am not doing that. This is not a good use of my time and my energy. So imagine I had sold one full page ad each of those hours. I would have been rolling in the dough. Okay. It wasn't worth my time and energy for me to do that job. The job still had to get done. It just wasn't my job to do. It was my job to figure out how to get it done. I love this quote that deciding what to do is as deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do. And that's very much where you're going to be at in, in your business. Deciding what not to do. So you are probably entrepreneurs are all familiar with the 80-20 rule. Hand up if you've heard about the 80-20 rule. Yes? Okay. So it's also known as Pareto's principle. The rule states that for many phenomena, 80% of the results come from 20% of the effort. So the principle, just to give you a little history lesson, was named after Vilfredo Pareto. <laughs> I love how his name rhymes. I'm, I could be saying it wrong too. He was an Italian economist who back in 1895 noticed that about 80% of Italy's land belonged to 20% of the country's population. So where 80% of the effect 
results from 80, 20% of the effort. 80% of complaints come from 20% of customers. 80% of profits come from 20% of the company's efforts. 80% of sales come from 20% of the products or services. 80% of sales are made from 20% of the sellers. And 80% of clients come from 20% of marketing activities. So what does this mean in practice? Well, it means that to maximize your efficiency as a business owner, you should focus on the vital 20% of activity. So once you realize that 80% of your outcomes come from 20% of the time and effort that you spend on them, the importance of prioritization becomes obvious. If you have a 10 item to-do list with each task being equally time consuming, you can boost your efficiency by identifying and completing the top two priority tasks. Even if you don't manage to get the rest of the tasks done, the 20% that you did complete could amount to 80% of the impact. And this concept plays into your high return on investment activities. By focusing on the top 20% of the activities for all of the roles you play, you're taking the you're doing the actions that will lead you to the results. Diana, are you open to a question? Uh, sure. So uh, Mega wants to ask, uh, what is your advice for a person having limited resources who wants to achieve financial freedom? That's a pretty big question. So over to you. That is a pretty, pretty big question. Uh, my advice would be to get a business where you can create passive income. I heard there was a real estate investor in the room. I also have a rental property, though it hasn't turned out very well for me in the Fort McMurray market these past few years. But um, that is one way to make passive income. When I opened my real estate brokerage, it was the same thing because I have realtors who work for me that they're going out and doing the work and I get a percentage of their cut. Uh, so passive income is incredibly important. No further questions. All right. Sounds good. So another strategy to move your business forward is focusing on your strengths versus your weaknesses. If you're finding that you're consistently failing or you're falling short on the goals that you've set, it might be time to consider trying to improve where you're already strong rather than focusing your efforts on getting better in the areas where you're weak. So we tend to view weaknesses as more changeable than strengths sometimes, which means that we're more inclined to try to improve the areas where we're weak. But studies have shown that when we focus on developing our strengths, we actually grow faster than trying to improve our weaknesses. Plus, people who use their strengths are happier and less stressed out and more confident. Um, another shift in, in that uh, idea there is that we think of strengths as things that we're good at and weaknesses as things that we're not. But think about it this way instead. Think about strengths and weaknesses by what energizes you. So strengths make us feel strong and weaknesses make us feel weak. To figure out your strengths, think about the activities you're doing that make you feel like you're successful or things that you're drawn to that energize you and that you're fully engaged in because it'll take less effort to achieve amazing results in those areas. And just because you're good at doing something, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a strength. If it drains your energy or sucks out your soul, you'll spend more time and energy first procrastinating about it then feeling bad about procrastinating, then when you finally get around to it, you're going to be distracted by so many different things that are way more exciting than the thing that you're trying to get done, that it will take so much more time and effort to get it done in the first place. Does that sound like a familiar cycle to anybody? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I want you to think, uh, take some time this evening to think about the things that you are good at in your business but that drain you. Those are things you might want to consider delegating, right? And then focusing more on the things that energize you that you're also good at. Another strategy comes from Brandon Burchard's book, High Performance Habits. I really like this book. Um, it's got some really good high performance habits in it. Uh, so it's the 50-10 strategies. The idea is to spend 50 minutes focusing on any one task followed by a 10 minute break. So first and foremost, you're going to decide what task you need to do. You're gonna get really clear on what you need to work on and what you're trying to achieve and write it down. 
Then you're going to eliminate distractions. You're gonna turn off your notifications, set your phone to do not disturb and keep off of social media. You're gonna set your timer for 50 minutes and you're gonna to commit to spending that 50 minutes on that task with no interruptions or distractions. And you're gonna work on that task until your timer goes off, being fully engaged in the task that you're doing. Then you're gonna take a 10 minute break. And when I say a 10 minute break, you're actually going to physically remove yourself from the environment that you're in. So you're gonna go up, get up and you're gonna stretch and take, have a coffee, maybe go to the bathroom, take a quick walk, whatever that actually removes you. I don't mean take 10 minutes and check your Facebook in the same chair that you were doing your work in. And then you're going to set your intentions for the next 50 minutes. So are you finished doing what you were doing? Do you need more time? Is it time to move on to something else? You know, set your intentions of what you want to accomplish in the next 50 minutes and of course repeat um, so follow this strategy all day for optimal focus and performance everything that i have spoken about today means absolutely nothing if you cannot stay focused the difference between entrepreneurs who make it and those who don't is unrelenting focus in today's day and age full of distractions and urgency this is one of the hardest jobs as an entrepreneur, but it is incredibly vital to your future success. Diana, a question? <clears throat> uh, we're gonna be, this is the last slide, if we could just hold off for just a moment. Sure. All right. So uh, speaking of keeping the focus, here are some ways to do that. So of course, we've already spoken about turning off your notifications. Facebook, emails, text messages, et cetera, these are all ways of demanding your time and attention when you have other more important things to focus on. Now, some of you who might have young children and you need to be available in case the school calls or there's an emergency, set one way that you can be contacted. So for example, let those people know that, hey, you can't reach me by Facebook or text, but if you phone me, I'll pick it up. Okay, turn everything else off. Um, bulk organize your tasks. So instead of answering emails as soon as they come in, for example, bulk organize your task and schedule that task, you know, twice a day to sit down and reply to all of the emails at the same time. A lot of times, you know, our phone is going off. I, for one, have about six or seven different email addresses that I monitor on a regular basis. And if I got a ding on my phone every time I got an email, my goodness, I would not get any work done in any given day. Um, I used to work for a lawyer who actually told me that every time you get distracted from what you're working on, it takes six minutes to get back into the right frame of mind to continue what you were doing. So imagine you had 10 distractions a day. 10 times six is 60 minutes, an hour of wasted time just trying to get back on track. And of course, you're going to get distracted way more than 10 times a day. So try to minimize those as much as possible. Um, stop prioritizing urgent non-emergencies. Remember, if everything is urgent, then nothing is urgent. We are in such an urgency-based society that we feel we need to respond to people at a moment's notice. Just think of back in 1950 when the only way someone could get in touch with you was by calling your home phone. Try to live back like that, <laughs> where people can't just get a hold of you, uh, you know, on the drop of a dime, and uh, and stop treating these things as urgencies. Trick your brain. Uh, follow the 50-10 strategy. Of course, we just talked about that. Create a reward system. This is something I talk to a lot of my coaching clients about. So trick your brain into getting a dopamine fix by creating a, a reward system for yourself. Set up a reward for yourself for keeping the focus and getting something on your to-do list accomplished. So whether your reward is like a hot bath, it could be a day off, it could be an ice cream, you know, whatever works for you, whatever will give you that sense of accomplishment aside from actually achieving the task itself. So when you're working towards a reward, your brain releases dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that motivates you, makes you feel good, it releases stress, and it has a whole lot of other physical and psychological well-being results. So reward system, that would be a really good tip for you. Write down your daily wins before they happen. So set yourself up for success by writing down your wins before they happen to act as a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? Set your intentions for the day. Be really intentional about what you plan to accomplish that day. And of course, make sure you're scheduling the high ROI activities. 
All right. I'm ready for some questions. <laughs> so my question is, and this is from me, uh, some people tell me not to begin the business day by looking at the emails that have arrived overnight. Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I appreciate hearing your point of view. Have you ever read Robin Sharma's The 5 AM Club? Anybody here read that? No? Highly recommend that book. Robin Sharma is one of my favorite authors. He is actually the reason I even started reading in the first place. And he talks about how you have the first hour of your day dedicated to setting yourself up for success. So taking care of like your physical state, taking care of your mental state, doing something that is going to propel you forward, motivate you throughout the day. Uh, for myself, I start my every, just about every single day. I'm not going to lie to you and say <laughs> it's, a, it happens every day, but just about every single day I wake up in the morning, I go and I make my cappuccino and I read a book for about 20, 25 minutes or so. And then I go and take a shower and then I start my day. Because if I'm first and foremost picking up my phone and getting right into work mode, then I'm creating that sense of urgency right at the beginning of my day, feeling like I have to respond to those emails at you know 6.30 in the morning when I've just gotten up. That is not a good way to set yourself up for success. Spend that first part of every single day for you not for your business, whatever that routine looks like for you. If it's journaling, if it's reading, if it's going for a walk, taking the dog for a walk, whatever it looks like for you, just make sure that you spend that time setting your day up, setting your, your mental state up for what the day has to come. Thank you. Question from Hassan. Uh, what are your recommendations for business development and marketing for coaches? business development and marketing for coaches. Well, for one, have a coach. <laughs> I know that sounds maybe obvious, but I, I've had coaches, many coaches. Since I've been a coach, I've had coaches before I was a coach. I uh, highly recommend to have a coach. Um, two, be authentic is, is really how I like to show up. I have a marketing background. I used to help people create their ads. And um, Authentic delivery to me is so important. When you are a coach, first and foremost, you're not going to be everybody's coach. There's going to be people who gravitate to the way that I operate. There's going to be people who are repelled by the way that I operate. You're not going to be everybody's coach. So figure out first and foremost, who your target audience is, who you're speaking to, who your ideal client is. Make sure that your message aligns with that audience and branding to me is incredibly important from a business perspective. You'll note throughout this entire slideshow, you've probably seen a lot of teal and a lot of white. That, that, those are my brands. In fact, the color behind me on my wall <laughs> and my other wall, gray and, and teal. Um, branding to me is really important, making sure that you have key messages, making sure that your marketing is consistent so that people know that it's you before they even know that it's you. Okay, and then of course, giving value. Uh, I heard tonight somebody uh, was saying about giving everything for free. Yes, as a coach, as, as any kind of professional, you can learn anything that you want on YouTube, okay? You can Google and look up answers to any questions that you have in the world. But there's a reason why people hire coaches, and there's something that you have to offer that you're not, that nobody is going to get from a YouTube video. So figure out what that is and put that out there because they're still going to have to hire you in order to, uh, to get the full results of what you have to offer. Don't be afraid of giving things away. Don't be afraid of giving the value away because giving away your value in that way will actually attract people to you. And I hope that helps. That's great. Uh, this is from Bob G. Any advice for aspiring life coaches? Question mark. Any certifications or licenses required? Question mark. How can a person get better on selling their products or services? Question mark. Okay, I might need to break that down a little bit. So coaching, 
what a lot of people don't realize about coaching is that it is not a regulated industry. Anybody can call themselves a coach without any formal training or experience or really even an idea of what coaching actually is. A lot of people confuse coaching and consulting and they are two very separate modalities. Uh, the International Coach Federation is a, it's not a regulating body, it's an overlooking body that you can get credentialed through. Uh, I have my first credential through there, the Associate Certified Coach. I had to go through a training program that included over 90 hours of in-class training and 300 hours of theory and, uh, and combined coaching. Uh, I had to work really hard to get that, to get there. Um, I think it was Hassan, Hassan, who gave some really good advice about credibility. So having, go, taking that extra step of getting credentialed gives you credibility, right? It tells people that you are serious about coaching other people, that you are investing in yourself while you're helping other people invest in themselves. Uh, I'm sorry, Roger, what was the third question? I'm can a person get better? How can a person get better uh, selling their products or services? Uh, again, investing in yourself to learn what you don't know when it comes to sales. I have been in numerous sales positions ever since I was 19 years old. I used to be a really great telemarketer who used to sell people stuff they didn't even need, like uh, credit protection on their city MasterCard when I was 19 years old. And my thought process when it comes to selling is don't. Don't go in trying to sell people, okay? Just go in and be genuine and be authentic and you'll end up selling yourself. Yes, you do need to obviously market, you know, what you offer and whatnot, but show your value, be genuine, create connection with people, and that will do all of the selling for you. And that's very much how I operate as, as a realtor as well for the past decade. I don't, I don't sell houses. I make connections with people and I help them reach their dreams. Diana, we're uh, pretty much uh, out of time. So on behalf of EIN's 78,000 members, I'd like to thank you hugely. Uh, your wisdom is really, really basic but like all really basic wisdom, it's so fundamental that we tend to look for much more complicated solutions. I love your seven step, your seven check mark uh, process. And I love the whole concept of asking us as solopreneurs to, to be aware of how we are spending our time so that we can embark on the process of maximizing the return on that investment of our time. So thank you hugely. Yes, thank you everybody. I really appreciate your time this evening. If you are interested in my entrepreneur's guide, take control of your time and grow your business, which recaps kind of what we've spoken about today. If you can just drop your email address in the chat and I will get that sent off to you uh, tomorrow. I really appreciate you all. Here is my Here are my contact details. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, pretty easy to find. I would appreciate connecting with each and every one of you on a more personal level, please add me as a, as a connection and, uh, and hopefully we can create some meaningful conversations through there. Thank you very much, Diana.